my name is Bonnie Conda from Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. And I'm here in Vienna at ISDE 2018, and I'm joined by my esteemed panelists. Peter Sears from Robert University, uh, Nine in Netherlands. Pratik Sharma from Kansas City. Ken Wang from Mayo Clinic, Rochester. Jerry Falk from University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And we are going to be speaking on assessment in Barrett's esophagus and risk for progression. So, Peter, what do we do as endoscopists to improve our detection of dysplasia? Well, of course, it all starts with a, a, a good quality, high quality endoscopy uh, using the latest generation endoscopes. I think all the main manufacturers uh, have, have very nice scopes to use. Uh, for me, it, it starts with, uh, with the, the normal scope, and then uh, when I see something, when I see an irregularity or when I see a lesion, I may decide also to use one of those facial uh, endoscopy uh, uh, tricks like uh, eye scan or MBI or um, whatever it is available. Um, and, and the, so that's the, that's the start. And then, um, well, we have also done some work on confocal laser in the, in the microscopy. Uh, and there's OCT, uh, of course, on the horizon. Uh, not as much in, in Europe yet, but I mean, I expect also that that will help us to, uh, to detect lesions. Uh, but again, I, I would like to stress that it all starts with a high quality endoscopy, take enough time and really uh, have a thorough inspection of the of these office. Great. And in terms of when you're training fellows or talking to people, how do we tell them to actually do that high quality exam? You say it over and over again, but what are our tips and techniques that we do? Well, I think, uh, as Peter mentioned, one of the important things is that the esophagus is not just a conduit to other places. It's to emphasize that for Barrett's, uh, more important than anything else is data is shown. You've got to just spend the time to look. So I think we have to teach people to look. Uh, I think one of the reasons I like uh, electronic chromoendoscopy is that it forces you to double your inspection time just by turning on uh, uh, whatever your tool is. It makes you look twice. So by using a chromoendoscopy, electronic chromoendoscopy, you get to look at areas twice. Uh, I think that uh, one of the other tools to, to be used that I've started using now more, especially with uh, electronic Zoom, is to put a cap on in people who have declared as dysplasia cases so that you can look a little bit more carefully at vascular and mucosal patterns. So I think it's emphasis, uh, it it's passion too. I mean, all of us sitting around here are passionate about Barrett's esophagus. And, and we've seen too often lesions that are missed because people don't spend time to look. It's careful insufflation and, uh, and removal of air. It's also washing, washing things off. But it, it all comes down to sp spending time and, and just looking. And once we identify that patient with dysplasia, how do you counsel patients on their risk of developing cancer or progressing? So the good news is that the majority of the patients won't develop cancer. And uh, also the good news is that the majority of patients with Barrett's that we'll diagnose uh, will have non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. So in patients who have documented non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, and going back, I think the first examination is the key. I mean, so what you find is that prevalent lesions are much higher than incident lesions. So very rarely or uncommonly, I should say, would you find patients who are non-dysplastic who five years later, ten years later, will develop uh, adenocarcinoma. It can happen, but it's uncommon. Whereas uh, having that first patient uh, who's undergoing that uh, inspection, I think uh, that's the key. So spending time doing that, so recognizing those patients is key. Once you've washed, looked at that, taken your biopsies, done the inspection that Niels taught us how to do uh, about the duration and stuff. That's when, and your biopsies show non-dysplastic parrots, uh, you know, the risk keeps getting downgraded every year. I mean, we started off with maybe 1% a year, then half a percent a year, and now it's, I guess, somewhere between 0 0.1 to 0.3% a year. I guess that's probably what it is. So it's uh, quite low. So. Most of the patients with non-dysplastic parrots, I think, will do well. And we mentioned some of the advanced imaging modalities. Ken, where do you see those fitting into widespread practice? 
Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the advanced imaging technologies eventually trickle down into widespread practice. For instance, zoom endoscopes are now becoming more available, and the high resolution available with those really allow you to very carefully classify the dysplastic characteristics of the mucosa. I think that's particularly true in the colon where they've been using this, the blue light imaging that you use in Europe to describe the uh, mucosal patterns can also be applied to Barrett's esophagus to find areas of dysplasia. And I, to Gary's point and to what you were hinting at earlier about how do you train, I think these technologies allow you to get immediate feedback onto if you're looking with narrow band imaging, you find a kind of funny area, you can magnify that and figure out right away whether or not that's anything really dysplastic or not. And eventually, you may not need to magnify as much because you're able to determine what it looks like even with a non-magnified high-resolution view, which we all accept as the gold standard. OCT, I think, is going to be useful in the future. It, it, it's going to be interesting because I think most of these technologies need to be constructed in such a way that experts aren't the ones applying them. They're using a lot of artificial intelligence to interpret the images for you, much like they do in radiology, to show you areas of concern so that you can then make the judgment. I think that will have the biggest impact. If a technology can only be used by an expert, it's not going to have much effect. And I think all these new technologies like OCT, where you can apply a lot of image analysis, hopefully will be the way forward for everybody to, to find areas of dysplasia, allow you to carefully mark out where they are, because they also have laser marking capabilities, and then be able to resect or treat them. I think that when it comes to new imaging technologies and watching this evolve over the last few decades, uh, there's this tremendous peer pressure. People feel when they come to national meetings and they hear experts that they're falling behind if they don't use them, even though the, the validation in, uh, is just not there, especially by non-experts. So I think that uh, we have to be cautious and not just be rapid adopters of new, very expensive technology without careful validation of them. I think that... Uh, I am very hopeful that we, we get to that point, but there's been the, one of these technologies after another has fallen by the waysides because there's initial enthusiasm, expert centers, and then when you start rolling it out, it just doesn't pan out. So it's not a matter of being negative about it, it's just I think we have to be critical and we can't forget the, the key tools and let the people who are doing, the investigators kind of sort this out because I think VLE is a great example that it's commercially available, you can buy it, but there's very little out that shows it can be done by non-experts as well as experts, and we really need uh, really artificial intelligence to analyze huge amounts of data that comes up for people. But having said that, I mean, the Seattle protocol that we use is really bad, right? I mean, I think we all agree, and uh, we have to move to targeted biopsies. And uh, finally, I think the societies have started endorsing that if you are good at some of these techniques, especially Spray chromoendoscopy and virtual chromoendoscopy, I think both have solid data which indicate that they do increase your detection rates of uh, dysplasia, I think. And if you're good at that, you can start taking and moving away from that and going into targeted biopsies. I think the random biopsies really don't help us. If you do a good inspection, you clean it, and on white light HD, you don't see a lesion. I think taking targeted biopsies probably gives you as good a yield, if not better, than the random ones. And I think the data completely supports that in expert hands. Yes, yeah. And that's the, but the problem is, is getting that into the community. Yeah. And the experts' abilities, you know, you guys have been looking at Barrett your whole lives. You're very confident in what you're seeing. But what we see in the community is they're not. And that's why I well, think... Well, in the community, they don't even take the random biopsies, right? So that's part of the problem. Is that's that absolutely... We just can't keep saying that they can't yeah. do it. I mean, they're not even doing what they're supposed to be. But, but, but if, you say, if you say you, you can do targeted biopsies, you do a careful exam, that really gives license to people who are ready not to do a careful exam, not to do careful biopsies. I mean, 
I agree with what you say on the one hand. On the other hand, there are clear data that if you, you, you find more dysplasia if you do the Seattle Protocol than if you don't, recognizing all its limitations. So the reality is people don't do a good job biopsying, they don't do a good job looking, and we've got to come up with better ways. And uh, I think, again, it, it, it's, people know there's pressure that you have to hit a target for adenoma detection. And uh, you know, you've advocated uh, inspection time, but there's no such target. The quality indicators, even though they've been published, aren't being followed and aren't being real. People aren't, there, people aren't getting report cards on quality indicators for Barrett's. Yeah, well, I think, so yeah, well, I think the, the main problem here is that the non experts only schedule six or seven minutes for an uh, upper endoscopy. And I think there's, there's mm -hmm. a problem. Then you don't have time enough to do a careful inspection. I'm already happy when they take biopsies according to the to the protocol, Turn them on. because then they sometimes they find a, a local dysplasia. These patients are being referred to a center where they have experts that can have a more careful look, and then we very often see a lesion that is uh, treatable by EMR or whatever. So uh, biopsies are for me even more important than uh, if they take it according to the protocol than a good inspection and coming from patients coming from non-experts. Yeah, but you know, we've tried doing other methods like cytological examinations and Watts brushes and so forth to try and substitute for those biopsies. But face it, it has not caught on. You know, they, they've all been available for some time. Gary, you were promoting uh, cytological examinations 20 years ago. And, uh, and you didn't mention that today. Because <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> It took Gary a long time to admit that it doesn't work. But, but, but that, 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 I think, is part of the thing. We're trying to find a substitute for our current methodology, which is clearly very expensive. And as Pratik was showing, all the studies showing it's not cost-effective. Yet, you know, that's what we rely on because of the practice patterns. I think that one of the things that, that is slowly coming out, though, is... Uh, you know, more tailored surveillance programs. It's starting outside of North America, both in Europe and I think also in, in Australia, of, of really, we've, we've said for years, every three to five years, I don't think anyone does five years, but now this concept of tailoring surveillance according to length, it's a primitive start, but it's a start that longer segments clearly have increased risk. But I, so I think that there's, a, you know, things are moving slowly, but they're starting to move and Critique uh, has developed uh, risk scores. Uh, the, the best group has developed that. So I, I think that there's some clues coming. We haven't talked about biomarkers because that's a more challenging area. Great. Well, thank you.